I'm and I'm Dominic Kulamari, I'm with the North Bay Electric Auto Association and a chemical engineer by training. Hey, uh, Eric Schweiger, the executive director of the Southern County Bicycle Coach. Uh, Mark Soil, and I'm representing the second district for our supervisor, Rabbi. I'm going to look like Tony Lee, it's another Kevin Rachel Parks. Hello, everyone. Uh, Ken Zamp, it's another Kevin Rachel Parks. Robert, I will work as a fund candidate for Rachel Parks. Right there, we work at the moment. Hi, I'm Jeff Blake, and I'm here representing SOS Riddles. Mark Dale, representing the IO. I think for I'm the Secretary of the Area Agency on Aging. Jacob Kenzie representing the Transportation and Land Use Coalition. <laughs> Brian Lane representing uh, District Court. Dennis Harder representing Sonoma County Alliance. Tanya Nara, Director of Climate Programs for the RCPA. Peter Rupert is Director of Climate Programs for the SCCA. Mm -hmm. Robin Mark Lowe's known him from Europe. Yeah. There you go. The Farm SCTA staff. Dana Frey, SCTA staff. Andrew Nichols, SCTA, RCPA. Hi, this is Orlando Ramirez with Caltrans District 4. And then we also have Shauna Gauze, um, who has just informed me that she's having some audio challenges right now. So I'll introduce on behalf of Shauna. Mm -hmm. um, and then also um, we have Dina Erickson on the line using one of the AB2449. Not sure if anyone else is speaking. Oh. Can you guys hear me? I cannot hear you. You can. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you, Shauna. Can you hear? Um. I'm Shauna Goss at CTA while I'm at it. <laughs> All right. I'm gonna check my audio real quick. Orlando, were you able to hear? Yes, I can hear. Okay. Um, so just carrying on with the AB 2449, I do need to read a paragraph into the record uh, for Gina Erickson in that, um, Gina had notified me this morning that she'd be attending remotely pursuant to AB 2449, which allows up to two virtual attendance per calendar years for Just Cause. Um, and so to, the circumstance of today's Just Cause is, um, what, is, what, is, what did she say? How did she say it? Um, yeah, so I guess it would, it would be the same as, as for the other committee. Um, I can't remember that one. Yeah, I believe it was a, an issue with some transportation to the committee. Um, and we have a good um, challenges with transportation to attending this committee in person. And then uh, we do not need a vote on, on this. So, um, Gina, do you have anyone else over the age of 18 present at your remote location with you? She can hear. If we're going to say no, and I don't, yeah, and we don't need a vote on that, so we can move, carry on with the next item. I think uh, two weeks to declare the location, because uh, we don't need, we cannot be in Alexandra Rosa and have a guest experience. That's my understanding. That is for traditional Brown Act. Um, if I'm informed, before the 72 hour requirement, then I do need to know the exact location. But since we're using the um, AB 2449 just cause exemption, we do not need the declaration of the location for the remote participation in today's meeting. Yeah, it's, it's a bit complicated. <laughs> Any of the 
not seeing any. I'm not seeing any members of the public. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's two uh, members of the public right now. We have Orlando Ramirez from Caltrans and then Gina Erickson on the Zoom call right now. Uh, there are no other members of the public on the call. Any discussion? All in favor? Yes. Okay. Oh. Which one? 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 The minutes you can vote on that. Yeah, she wrote it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the financial savings, James. You sit. Yeah, item four the measure and project presentations from Sonoma County Regional Parks. So thank you. And thank you for having us again. It's been a year since we presented. It's nice to do this in person this time. Um, my name is Logan as well as the Pyrie with Snow County Winter Parks, and I'm really pleased at 10 p.m. is joining us today. Last meeting, you all um, asked a number of detailed questions, and Kendra got it because he has the detailed answer of um, where these projects specifically are and the specific work that's occurring at, the, at each of these rather than my general overview of the funding and time. So um, I'm really happy that Ken was able to join us today. So we're reporting on the three major M projects um, today, and we also have some update information for uh, Joe Doe Trail, the three bridges projects, and also the West County Trail gap closure. Those are other active projects right now. And I do have a few maps of the three projects to share in case you want to see one of these maps. While we're looking at this, I don't have one of them, but um, but when we take one, we can wish for a short trip. The first handing around the Bodega Bay Trail project, and then after that, the Central Central Valley Trail project. The third one on the list is the Sonoma Shell Mill So, those of you who have been um, with this group for a while, you know we've been working on these projects in the multiple phases um, as funding and as opportunity and as a so can we go to the next slide? Uh, Where's my cursor? So first, um, the Vega Bay Trail. Um, just a general overview. This is a this is a three mile long trail um, separated from Highway One, and as all of us know, that Highway One is narrow if you or if you're walking on. The road for much of the corridor and it's kind of tough to get around, especially when you know, while you're in no vehicle go down the road. Um, so we've been working on um, a number of phases. We've completed the at the southern end, the Chain Creek Bridge, which 
connects Bird Walk with the access to Dora Beach Mutual Park. Then at the far north end, we created the connection from Heath Avenue all the way south to the community center in the middle of it. And the next project in line is the um, Hilton North Harbor section, and that's the section that's going to be going out today. We need to move forward to the map. We need the next slide. Okay. We completed one point oh back one, please. There we go. Um, and so <laughs> one point five miles, and the next one in Q is the Coastal North Harbor segment. So that's connecting. If you're familiar with the community center is with the northern end of the data bay. It'll take you across the county land and down the hill to you know, where East Shore Road meets um, West Side Road at the bottom. And so it crosses to um, State Park land, laid some campsites there. And it's um it's pretty um it's pretty challenging terrain. Um, but we've developed um, designs, and developed designs. That meet um, ADA access, so we have to see that access. Um, I think it's about 800 feet in elevation being where the community said it could develop on the site down to the intersection of the road. And so um, that project, oh, there are 10 too. The plan I'm going out to bid is all with the current plan for construction. Right. So, what's the lead? So what's remaining is the actual coastal permit that the panel not going with that the, the project is within the coast. So it does require a review by the post commission. So we've submitted our application to MLA. So as soon as we get the coastal permit approval, as well as the building permit approval, they would be receiving the coast permit in this project. So as Linda mentioned, it is a challenging way to work uh, accommodation on this side as well as elevated roof floor walks to transition to PNR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it goes from the county community uh, property to the 87th and to the next slide. That's an overview of the Measure M funding. Um, and then yeah. so that gets shows what's funded, but the following slide actually shows the alignment on the uh, on the aerial map. If you could move it to the next slide, please. So this shows the alignment for the community center and winding down um, the hill to be short. Yeah, just following the yellow line, the solid yellow line back to the you know, And then the next project in view is, and the next slide is on Smith Brothers Road. So this is jumping to the south of the town. Um, and so this is Smith Brothers Road. It's a trail that you can make off Highway One. Um, it's just north of Birdwalk Coastal Access. And then you take the turn into I forget the name of the shopping center. I was going to say it's right. <laughs> Um, and so this this trail parallels the um, Smith Brothers Road. Another since last time we received um, we're in the process of receiving the budget from State Public Agency. They own some parcels along Smith Brothers Road that will be creating the opportunity for some public areas along there. Mm -hmm. um, if you're familiar with that stretch of road, um, it, it's nice to you know just watch on in the bay from there. People you know, hike boarding and you know, slower swims that way you know, on the water. So it's a really nice area. So this will you know up for loose <laughs> and then the third um the final Oh, no. Yeah, sorry about that. Somehow I just got the Zoom quit unexpected on me. I'm not sure what happened right there. 
So I, I can pause if there's any questions on the Bodega Bay Trail project. What's the current timeline for which part? The individual ear? <laughs> well, like Ken said, the you know, uh, North Coastal Fire is going up with it. Um, Frederick's Road, possibly sometime next year, we're working with the um, and really um, the center section that's a little bit current. Yeah, on Smith Road. Trying to provide less space between the spread and the support channel. One thing we are going to make it now is possibly look at converting that two names of those into one name. So um, that would definitely require some complications with the count times. These count times have been one each right in the spread of the road. So we've been in some discussions, but we have not got any uh, confirmation of whether that's going to be quite or not. But those are some of the challenges. Um, some of also along that quarter uh, for the acquisition of some of the parcels owned by full superintendents, we also discovered uh, I think one or two uh, significant uh, private property encroachments onto the public right way and also to the public parcels. So, one of the 12 property owners see what modifications we made over to how many one and how many um but yeah I if everything we can sort out the, those details and those issues um maybe uh the Smith Brothers Road second maybe next year with a section of long the uh, harbor the board on the bats and take I probably this five plus year because the overall for the lot more environmental impacts a lot of you you're building a, a elevated boardwalk in the the tidal lands, and so the sensitivity of this habit has to be addressed. So we need to work with the on the board, all the regulatory of the U.S. Fish Wildlife Service as well as the state system. Thank you. 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 Last year, but I'll ask it again, um, climate change and sea level rise. I know that this is probably the most um, at-risk segment of this trail. That anything change in terms of stage requirements or anything like that? I think so outside of that, that's that rise. Yeah. Not yet. Yeah. I think HC was a coastal commission. Well, we'll provide uh, the requirements for that. We are working with them on another project on the police and beach where um, there's public access where the highway laundry line is occurring. Just give me that as an example. Um, there are some public access to the Scotty Creek beach area if you can know that area. It's just no. about the yeah, um that area is I don't know, see that on the I can't remember the exact year, but that year will be beach will be innovated, will be covered. But the Coastal Commission says still provide public benefit and allow the public to use that area until such time happens. So we are still going to provide public trail access down to the lower area that again will be innovated. At a future date, but we hope us gave us direction still provide the improvements to allow the public still enjoy it for that period of time until it becomes in the game. You're not anticipating that problem here. Yeah, uh, I have to take another look at the mass. The part of the portion of the game is as well. Yeah, the boardwalk we actually we have it's, uh, for the harbor section. We actually haven't set the not this one, the one along the um. It's the coastal harbor section. The ones along, yeah, the, yeah I don't like have a, a detailed map of that area, mm -hmm. uh, but that's the last segment. That segment, we actually have to set the elevation of the waters at this time. But for the other portion, the, the north harbor section, we've actually kind of set the elevation. That one's actually much more inland because it's actually a higher elevation. That, that's your idea. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And the, the coastal north harbor actually serves as a tsunami. Can you go back, uh, please, to slide number five, the funding in a slide, and you know, explain it, explain it to me in more detail. Yes. And so, going from top to bottom, so what we've extended the Cheney Creek, Creek Bridge is the one that connects um, Birdwalk. Whistle access to Warren Beach. And so we completed that project 
and um, $100,000 and the match, uh, much of the match would be at the state coastal conservancy for that. The coastal prairie trail is at the northern end of the Dega Bay Trail. So taking it, if you started with the uh, community center, the Gulf Town site, and go more to Keith Avenue, that's the stretch we completed um, over over a few years and local funding sources. Um, and the 1.25 3 million. Um, so that's a place that was a lovely stretch of trail. Um, and then what Ken was talking about, the coast of North Harbor, that he's looking to go out to the like this okay. The next one on the list, um, and 328,000. Black is one called it's uh, 340,000 from Measure Hill. And the Smith Brothers Road by the southern end of town, that's 50,000 from Measure M. So, but you know, in like his program, you know, projects are the fully funded now? Also, North Harbor is Smith Brothers. We, to this point, is that design may require additional funding. So as far as we know, it's fully funded, but if more issues come out of design, it might require more funding. More funding. Um, Coastal Harbor, this is our estimate at this time, and we don't know full funding. Yeah, we don't know the full design solution for that. Thank you. You're Any more questions? Um, and the second part. Yeah, thank you. So moving forward to Central Sonoma Valley Trail. And the next slide, please. So this is the next. I think we hopped over your the map. Oh no, map. I gotcha. So I'm sorry. This is the this is the overview of the project. I mean, I'm going to point them miles in place. Um, some of that was funded with Measure M funding, some a developer in the field, some outside sources of the field. And this is again uh, hitting people off a highway. So it's hitting people off Highway 12 in um, Central City of Valley. Um, next slide, please. So this is the map of the project area in red um, are stretches that were completed both at the north end um, and the south end, just opposite of Maxwell Farms Regional Parks. And then the green line is what was completed through <laughs> Larson Park in Central Snow Valley Trail. And then that actually, can you give the, because the next phase of it ties into the wayfinding signs, really the next phase of the project is connecting this corridor off road through these through these neighborhoods that would require additional position and we're looking at guiding people through this corridor with wayfinding signs. So for this particular project, um, I also want to mention that uh, we also have a uh, partner name with the AHC, uh, Sonoma County Transportation Public Works. Uh, they're actually they're responsible for doing the class two bikes on and the class two uh, class three routes. Uh, our department is primarily focusing primarily on the class one. So the segments that we're presenting today, the segments that we've completed, uh, there are a couple areas that extra points will be showing now. This kind of circle. Uh, there are some right away uh, streets on the key. One of you by Wafer Exchange, we do not have permission from the property owner to put out some to stay. There's a couple we've actually approached a couple. And they have not responded pretty much by not, but them not responding to our request for the keys and pretty much just telling us, you know. Um, so in the interim, what we are looking at, we're having uh, another consultant or transportation consultant look at the ticket. I'll look at the alignment again to see if there's any uh, tweaks or changes that we need to make. Um, so what you're looking at, this alignment was done years ago, it was done in 2001. And now we're at, you know, with the seconds we did thus far and some of the additional striping work Sheros has done by public works, we we're asking the um, consultant to take another look at this alignment and see if we need to make any changes to the alignment. 
in addition to to maybe to cast and wait by the side because if you look at this route, it's not a straight shot. This does use a combination of on street and off street connections. So unless you actually have some signage from the pedestrians and bicyclists when you're riding along this corridor, that's all kind of a problem. They're not necessarily unless they're local, you should have really going, but you're not about it, you're not going to go find an easy route to go from National Park to Joe Park, heading north all the way down to for a quality school. So our consultant will look at the alignment again and provide recommendations, um, uh, recommendations for locating these wayfinding sites where they would be placed and directing uh, by system to traffic on the corridor. So that's the, the next thing for us to do. And the next slide shows the overview of Measure M, by the way, um, that we've used for the different segments of trail. Um, Larson Park was the first stretch that we completed, um, and that was matched with um, TDA Article 3 funding from state parks and um, Proposition 40 money and our park mitigation fees. The connection from Flowery School to Veronica Avenue, $120,000 in Measure M funding, and then our matching funds of $520,000, $525,000. So DMAC funding as well as park mitigation fees. And then the developer um, created the connection between Sonoma Charter School all the way to the Valetti property. Um, you know, that's really, that's really uh, Valetti Drive on the north end, heading south all the way down to the Valetti. It was a part of a, a condition of develop, uh, development for, there was two things happening in that area. There was a, a housing, that had housing within a uh, affordable housing project there. And also um, Valetti um, was also doing commercial developments. As a result of their project impacts, um, they had to provide contribute to Google as pedestrian circulation in that area. So to offset that, to mitigate that impact, um, they constructed, uh, they did get a park mitigation credit, we charged them for that, but they constructed and designed that one for us because that particular was a very important connection at People Road because it connected to the, the new homes in the area. It connected to uh, on the south end of the Flowery School and also it provided connections directly to the north. Um, to the Sonoma Charter School. So that particular segment is very, very important to provide connection to pedestrian bicyclists to be able to commute, commute go to school, between the two schools, and also put housing as well, as well uh, as the uh, universal commercial uh, units along that corridor. So it was, it was good that we were able to leverage uh, as part of the condition of development. So we were, didn't need to acquire um, that was measure M plus and, and the next slide actually shows a picture of the trail where it intersects Flowery School. So it had connecting north from Larson Park mm -hmm. into Flowery School. That's a question right here. Yeah, I have a, a question and, and some comments. So the question is I just want to make sure that I understand correctly that so the section um, marked in, in black. This is not going to be any new construction or just refining and stuff for that. Okay. Okay. Um, so my comment about um about some of that is um I have to say that if so are you just doing the is regional parks just doing the study or are you going to be executing that as well? Uh we're actually gonna um do the study. Mm -hmm. We'll share the study with public works because we don't uh it's within the group the science and we look at within the work by the way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, this is not absolutely. Yeah. You know, so many of our, our trails and paths and routes in our county are not very well signed. Regional parks does probably the best job of intervening those patients on weekly paths. So that's what I was thinking. <laughs> I'm hoping you guys were going to do it. Um, I'm like, I worked in Petaluma for two years before I even knew the Lynchtree Trail existed. And even though it knew it existed, I had a hard time finding it. You know, so there are, and there are so many other things like that. Um, and then every jurisdiction, of course, does it a little bit differently. Um, I was in uh, Scotland last summer and hiked across the country and a lot of walking and biking paths. And they, their, their system was brilliant in that each route had its own little icon. You know, they were different colors and numbers, whatever. And they would be just on 
Sometimes there would be a sign that had the icons for whichever directions, and other times it would just be on an existing fence or on a pole or on a rock, you know. And and I've got a lot of ones in place where they are kind of not hard to see, but um, it can be simple, you know. And sometimes it gets, I don't know, it seems like getting all the consultants in to come up with sign stuff can be more complicated than it needs to be. Last comment um, the stretch, I have concerns here about the stretch. Um, at the south end, where it's actually on Highway 12, I attended the Springs Municipal Advisory Committee meeting a week or two ago. Um, we're hearing from a lot of folks with a lot of status and outrage over pedestrian deaths that happened at that intersection, and they're feeling that the, there is sort of the equity issues in terms of residents being able to hear we're putting all this money into this park and we can't let the kids walk to it because people are getting killed at that intersection. So, um and I don't know how that I'm working with Caltrans you know, or how Caltrans is getting involved in that piece. But um, if, if there was any piece of this that needed to be separated, it would be what you, what's shown right here on Highway 12. You mean uh, Kitsian eats on Highway 12 and the Street? The class one is separate, it stops at Main Street. So we come up to Main Street, see the intersection 12. Right at the north end of the park. And where yeah, the yeah, that little there. section there. The section that was named in Highway 12. Yeah. If I can put off in your question, mm -hmm. why, why do you think you consider a fair view lane, you know, like to connect them rather than, you know, Highway 12, which is safer? <laughs> well, it's the state experience, and that's what the consultant recommended back then. 2001. I mean, the, the comment we got from the federal public was that they knew that Highway 12 would eventually, I mean, they actually some section had it to the class C. But before that work had, uh, happened, the community expressed to us that they want to have an experience where they can actually use another pathway other than. So, this, that's my valid trail as a result of that. Um, the comment got from the general public said, yeah, we're going to have fighting in the Highway 12, people that are experienced, cycling one even if we can. But also provide another round of parallel time control that's not mentioned. Mm -hmm. Which is where, where is the federal area? Yeah, well, you know, the fact that they actually have black line, that, that is the yeah. yeah. Again, it's not necessarily a direct straight route. You know, you can't see that goes through the community. Anything? Yes. <laughs> okay, just to on the inside, there's 1.7 that's to be programmed. And, and so, Getting at the end of this measure around, just wondering how that's going to work there. How do you envision that? That's a very good question. So, really, mutual parks focus has been the removal of the road, the class one trails. You have to have a third view to develop these uh, class one trails that are not on the roadway. And so, we our goal with the wayfinding signs and the study that's done for that, that will link to some of the work. That could be done with the remaining amount that's programmed for Central Cinema Valley Trail. Um, because, yeah, because we don't have the break in it, because we that's a portion, but we don't have we don't have other class one trail sections that we're doing with regional parks. So our goal is that it would guide some of the name with this. And the other thing I wanted to bring up is we're also working on the the longer Sonoma Valley Trail connection that will connect Sonoma really all the way to San Luis. It's a broader picture of really launching the next stretch of a trail corridor that Ken's also working on with Caltrans. And you think you'll be able to, to, you know, make part, I mean, just like the Bodega Bay on the trail, which just moved from last year to this year in that whole Smith, you know, Area, the road area, it didn't seem like much because you had the same opportunities. I think last time we we're here with all the various government agencies that you have today. And so, uh, and, and, and uh, how, you know, like how things roll around different area is just how can we make sure that that one seven is spent in you know, the best way uh, for measure out. Yeah. 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 
I'll prepare to say, can you refresh, you know, our memory, what will happen, you know, to projects that are funded you know, by Measure M and the Measure M ends, you know, what will happen to this funding? Sure. So once the measure ends in April of 2025, the fund will still be in place for this project and others. It's the remarked to the measures to be for this project. So, you know, Regional Parks has a segment of the project, they have one advance that we would be able to that. If uh, what you speak about the country is called work problem, it's not this. If the trick department wanted to advance the project, that then you could occur as well. I should note that staff from SCTA and public infrastructure cultures have had a lot of discussion over the last year. So I would call the line down the intersection that Harris mentioned earlier, and also that two gap along the highway 12. We just noted in the past. Map here about what to do with the bridge over highway 12 or the creek, and we're continuing to come up with some potential solutions. But we don't have the data this time. Thank you. Hi. So, you will not lose the funding if we stay in that. Thank you. Thank I have a question. Um, um, so, I understand there's like a jurisdictional difference between your purview of class one paths and public infrastructure over the other paths. Um, Considering now that we have class four bike lanes, which are sort of a, a little bit closer to uh, class one, um, is that part of your design strategy for this section at all, or are you still using just the three classes for your current plan for this path? Uh, for the Central Spring Valley Trail? That, I mean, that is, uh, I guess, a tool, a tool that we can, or tool that we actually can use. If it's yeah, appropriate, yeah, we can use it. Yeah. So as you do the realignment, because one of the things that's kind of emerged for me is, and I thought about this, and there's probably some logic to adding class ones under, you know, parks purview. But on the other hand, um, if the only tools in the public infrastructure historically have been the class two and class three, at least in the county areas. And we're seeing that that's not best practice any longer. So um, it's going to be really important to coordinate with public infrastructure on you know, the best use of that money to make sure that we have the safest and, and most functional route around the right of way access constraints and so uh, when do we expect that relook of the alignment when do we expect that to occur i don't have a date right now the person that was uh, all the planning is the consultant we have on board uh, the person that will decide to do the work has been as not mm -hmm. um, so one way to find who's going to be in place that individual the work but uh we, we have a moment I don't have some games. Okay. And then if I could just um, give you a little feedback, if we could go back to the photograph that we started this section on. Um, yesterday, I think it was, I was driving uh, toward the camera and, um, and crossing the Toronto Street Bridge, which is just beyond that far you see in the picture. And a bicycle rider was on. They had just come out of the park on the other side of the street, the well, Maxwell side of the street to the left of this photograph. And they were doubling back toward the bridge that came out and they went, they kind of went up, up toward the camera and then turned around and doubled back. And they took that little uh, short segment that I asked you guys to add that's right before the bridge. And what they were doing was getting off on to use your path, your new class one path, because they wanted to be, I suspect, on this side going into springs. They didn't want to have to deal with either crossing further, and this is gets a much faster segment of, of traffic in here. And it's also kind of a freeway like experience on it. So I thought that was actually kind of a very uh useful uh, and unanticipated use of that little cutoff. But that was what somebody was doing 
to have what they thought was the safest route on a bicycle. A little bit of feedback there. They could have and they could have turned you know, on across the bridge, cross and come back up. Because that was a great uh, It's it's crazy what people do on bikes to say it's safe out there. Yeah, that's all I have myself. Yeah, no, thank you for the feedback. Uh, you know, we want to build more, make it safe, but the challenge is, uh, you know, right away acquisition. Yeah, but I mean, we like to work well with partners that I mentioned previously. Um, some partners are not interested in selling the public access, and then we need to make those that's their safety improvements. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the section uh, that we just did at Brown Brown I mean, the reason we didn't get that long say that that's all county property. Right. right. Yeah. Right. And again, that's why we should put dark red on there so those will be the low um, right away. Yeah. Yes. Well, I mean, the one that goes through to depot and the you know, that was a challenge as well. The visual property owner uh, said, no, I'm not going to give you the easement on it. But uh, father passed away. Uh, the son took over. The son had a different vision. The son saw an opportunity to um, subdivide his property. So, of course, I was talking for housing, and he would obtain a third or four of this is in a trust. So, he worked out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see no more questions and move to the first segment of the presentation, please. Thank you. So we'll move forward with the Sonoma Shell Oil Trail. We have to move forward to the next slide. The picture of Sonoma Shell, a couple of photos. There you go. And so the next slide. Um, and this is part of the little presentation of the chair. This is great news for you all. I am thrilled we have uh, the of an acquisition agreement with the Pacific to acquire the rail corridor along Eighth Street Leeds. And we are looking back at record. We've been looking back and looking at this since 1986, not us, but uh, those before us. And so this is really, this is monumental, monumental news that we have an acquisition agreement. So there are sections. There's it, it's so jumping ahead from the map. <laughs> we, we did update the map for, for this. If you're if you can move it forward to the map, um, because that does paint the picture, it's much more clear than our maps last time. Yes, it is the four sections, the uh, red sections. And so it's just okay. So Sonoma Shellville, um, the rail corridor. Um Generations ago, it was acquired in pieces. It was like Spanish land grant times with and the town of Sonoma is being developed. So it was just a little bit complicated mm -hmm. as far as title report and you know, started to find who owned what and when. And so, yeah, we've been, and actually, that's where measure and funding has really helped us. And it's all such background information gathering so we could understand who owned what out there. And so, yes, four red sections are what we acquired. These are the B lands that Union Pacific holds that were acquired. And it also made the deal. They wouldn't sell us with sell it to us without buying buying the um the right way underlying 8th Street East. So Union Pacific owns a few stretches of right way on 8th Street, which is just crazy. But there's really not much value in that. So yeah, we get ultimately these um are will create the basis for the trail. There's some um, existing segments of this that we have agreements or offer to dedicate some of these stretches of trail. And actually, Kent, I'll turn it over to Kent. We can talk through what these, what each of these sections are, because he has the depth of information on what's where in this corridor, because it's, it's complex, but it's so exciting that we're able to move forward with it. <laughs> Uh, uh, starting on the uh, the north on the curve, uh, where it says the existing uh, easement from Soma's uh, best that was acquired in 2004. Now, again, that was part of the project condition. Uh, the developer of Soma's best was required to provide an X amount of you know, parking space for development and to reduce the number of parking spaces. Um, he granted the public access to the trail back in 2004. He actually uh, purchased the former rail ride from New Pacific and returned the B title and granted a public accident. 
which we can show in a little bit. Um, next, going down south, we have that square. Uh, that is when the parking lot has been fenced off. That's the point three two acres that we got as a uh, land dedication in the Zabel development. Um, the history behind that is that. Um, the owner wanted to increase the density. The minimum size, he had one lot. The minimum size he could buy his lots in three lots. Uh, he requested an exemption to increase four lots. In order to do that, he had to show public benefit. So, in return, uh, to show public benefit, he actually uh, developed to uh, install a part of the lot and then dedicate a, a portion of land to the county. So, that happened in 2015. Uh, heading south down to the next segment, uh, we currently don't actually have the easement. This time we have what's called a key offer to dedicate an easement. Uh, this is next to the Weinberg uh, self-storage facility on the east side of East Street East. As part of his development, again, it's part of the condition development for his project in the past, he uh, gave us an offer to uh, dedicate an easement. Reason we didn't accept the uh, the easement, there is some restrictive language that you you Pacific included in the um, in the property shop title transfer to the I don't know if it was what it's called, but, uh, he said uh, he said that um, that he cannot the land could not be used for public land So our attorneys advise us not to accept the. So it's working with the city to clear that land. They actually have that language in a couple other parcels um, down there that need to work with the city to get that land cleared up. Then the, the, uh, the last couple um, parcels, same thing, they was part of their project development, we were able to uh, condition to get an uh, access and over the process. So again, we don't own, except the show investments. The other two where we have uh, easement, but you know, this is shown as last parcel to itself. We actually own it. And so ultimately, this connects to the the curve, and that after the curve, that's a, a later phase of the project that will connect to the um, the Sonoma Trail in the town of the Sonoma. And you see on the far left side that side that green block. So that's Maxwell Park and Richard Park. So the park that we're just looking at at the end of the Central Sonoma Valley Trail. Um, and at the south end of this, Smart owns that property where it connects down to the highways there. So we'll work with them on that connection. And then ultimately, after it crosses, it will connect to the Bay Trail. It goes to the south, crossing south, and connect to the 500 mile trail that encircles the bay. And so this connects to, you know, regional trail in the future. So it's a big step for us in this May year project. Um, and so as Ken went over, we have we have three easements and we have one offered to dedicate along the full north. This is a will create a four-mile trail connection. And jumping to the next slide for the measure of M funding. And so yes, we've used a lot of funding money for scoping and then for right away. And then we'll be um, looking to use the remaining funding for acquisition and for the acquisition. We have a, a, a grant request in to the yeah, open space district for a matching grant. And we've also been um, asked to submit a proposal to the state coastal conservancy for um, a $600,000 grant from them for this acquisition. So this really, um, really moves us forward. And the last slide talks about the next step. The next steps, and I come to the end when I announced the purchase agreement, that's what we're just so excited about. Um, and then, really, assembly and due diligence is underway and uh, site assessment. And as Ken was talking about continuing the negotiations with the adjacent landowners, um, some of whom have different interests with the Pacific. So, what questions do you have on this initial? Level? Just what we have the uh the purpose price for this the UP is over two million two point six million. But they give it to, for the price for three years. <laughs> <laughs> we wish. We wish. If you go ahead and bought there, you, you see it's some areas is all weeds. Um, 
it's, it's not the best condition. But there's also a good portion of the drainage ditch within the right way too that runs parallel up with the vice drainage. So all that for two. Months. That's why a lot of the deep departments have gone separate few. Not, um, they've actually offered part to us get to the uh, sale of the first year. Uh, we did try to unload sections of the property, but the property is so why would I want to buy a change ditch? Right? So, yeah, two point six million is a lot of road. Right. Yeah. And yeah. with all the title and feed problems. Yeah, a lot of time. I have a title. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I was actually flying around in Google Maps looking at this route the other day, and I noticed toward the bottom, they this is running on the east side of the Main Street East. And as we get close to the terminus, the south point of the trail, I think I noticed that there's a new warehouse development down there that's gone in at the corner. Okay. And it's it struck me that there new wall was intruding into what would be that area and it's graded with pretty deep uh, drainage ditch through there. That seemed to be one of the you know, most significant pinch points that had just been developed. Is, is that the area that was in your um, where's it? I'm not exactly clear on this map where, where it was, but it was you're, you're not in your head. You remember the names of those streets? Well, it's it's right there along 121. Right. It's the main corridor. Yeah. And um, there's a classic railroad um, station on the corner across from this large building. It was going to be potentially an Amazon mm -hmm. um, package. Yeah, on the west side. And, yeah, on the west yeah. side. It's a very large warehouse yeah. building, right. and it's been vacant um, yeah, for like five time. or six years since it was. Instructed, but the trailer is on the east side. Yeah, it's on the east side. Right. So I think maybe we're not talking about exactly no. the same location. No. So I think we'll get back to him about yeah, the question after the yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, and then I wouldn't be doing justice to my co-commissioner on the City of Sonoma Climate Action Commission. Ad hoc transportation committee. If I didn't bring this up, um, but my colleague on that commission has uh, raised the specter of possible trolley streetcar for tourism use in the city of Sonoma, and has a vision of having parking south of the plaza with some kind of a streetcar. And it came up in our discussions that this was once a rail access but my understanding is that this is no longer this is what's called abandoned rail and that it would be exceedingly complicated to try to have train back into this in the future is that your understanding as well? yeah they've already um they've already moved forward human city already moved forward to abandon the right of course that's that enabled them to be the only <laughs> yes. uh, that train has left the station exactly <laughs> Yeah, and like how long ago was that? Was in the stretch between Sebastiani and Haiti North, that was in the 1940s. And this stretch from Sebastiani, that was actually Sebastian that's what they lived with us on the route down to Shelville was in 86. 86 is when they had the most recent because it was, was only serving Sebastiani and um bringing in soybeans for tricky wheat. Mm -hmm. Curious things that we learned. Yes, yeah. Yeah. history thing. No, thank you. A lot of turkey farming and snow. Right. Thank Any you. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, so a quick overview for um, the Georgia the Trail and West County Trail. Turkey's over the pins. These are, these are a quick updates on. Yeah, I have yeah, two other project updates. These uh, projects. Um, you do not have any uh, measure M tied into them, but they are class one bike tracks that I'm working on. So uh, the Georgia Dota Trail and West Ham, they're two different segments. So, um, next. Yep, next slide. So the Georgia Dota Trail bridge replacement, this project is located um, between uh, Illinois Avenue and Mono Road. 
<laughs> this particular corridor, there's actually three existing bridges. Uh, the middle bridge actually replaced the, the timbers and wood decking uh, not too long ago. But we also had two other bridges, one close towards Pillman Avenue and one close towards Bond Avenue. They're actually failing. Um, they are actually were part of the original railroad trestle bridges. You know, they were. And what we did to make it useful, we just replaced the, the decking, some of the timbers, but some of the bottom timbers are, are starting to rot. So we got funding through, um, through OBAG, and we have funding to replace bridge number one and bridge number three. The tenant schedule replaced those bridges. We actually, before we replace them, we will provide a temporary access for bicycle. We won't shut it down. We'll actually build the temporary access so pedestrian bicycles still have this. This is a major corridor that connects. Spashful into San Rose and vice versa. So we can't completely shut it down. With, uh, so we'll provide temporary pathways while we're replacing the bridges. Um, the original schedule was to do construction this uh, summer, this fall. I spoke to the bridge manufacturer a uh, few days ago. They are back on bridges right now. We're using prefabricated steel bridges. Um, the name of the company is Contact. It uh, looks like we may not be able to do this until maybe next year because they have too many bridges in the pipeline. They're, I mean, this is a shop. They crank these out and they're all pre manufactured, but probably they have so many other projects in the uh, They can't commit. But if they schedule it for an hour, we'll allow it, we try to get it done this year, but we may not next year. All right. Question. Yep. Uh, all bag funds, can you refresh my memory? One bay area. MTC out. Yeah, one uh, one Bay Area grant is cycle two. But, uh, next slide. All right, so this uh, project is the West County Gap Closures. Um, we actually have two gaps that are not uh, class one by path. Um, we got money from the uh, SIP program, the surface, the state transportation. Uh, we'll get the site uh, We got uh, 3.1 uh, million, and Becky who's working through this committee and through SCTA to help us secure funding for that. Uh, so there are two segments. Um, one is along Green Valley Road, it's about a quarter mile long between Ross Road and Castledale Creek. Uh, we have a, a consultant on board. We'll be starting the design engineering on that in uh, the next couple of months. The other segment is the Oxnard Road, which is about 0.87 miles. It's um, between Highway 116 and just to the east side of Castlebury Creek. Uh, the design of that is about 90% complete right now. Um, and we're currently working on the environmental uh, project. Um, but the constructive funding doesn't uh, come into place until the year uh, 25, 26. So I'm not receiving ground break until next such time. So that gives us enough time to finish your design and share that problem. And if I could point out on the map, we can't the part of the ground line at the bottom. That's the Occidental Road. And then the pink line kind of in the middle, that's the construction of Green Valley Road. And then future phases that we're participating with Sonoma County infrastructure. So that's to north and all the way to River Road along the Red um, So those four doors there that some kind of infrastructure is using on um, those other interfaces. So we'll complete this whole corridor. And the next slide that shows you uh, what the existing conditions are of uh, these two or like the snapshot. Yeah. Yeah. And also to you know too during the um, the COVID pandemic, I mean, as we noticed a spike in terms of pedestrian, which is good. Pedestrian attempt by school use on both of these streets as it is. As you can tell, there is no Oxford Road. You can see there's two, actually, the, the day I was out there, there two students were actually jogging on the north side of Oxford Road. As is, you know that um, that particular road, cars can get up to 50, 50 that stretch. So the plan is to provide a separated Class one bike path on the north side on Oxford Road and on the main valley of the same thing. We want it out to that particular short stretch at a separate class one bike path on the stretch as well. Yeah, let's see. Do we have any questions uh, from the public? Yeah. Mm -hmm.
I'm not seeing any hands raised from members of the public on Zoom. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Now we have the state for this. Well, James and Boyd will propose me tonight, so I'll be covering this one. Uh, first up in your packet, we have a quarterly update showing our energy consumes in order the fourth quarter of 2022. Due to inflation, we are still doing big growth as of that quarter. Uh, I should note that the projections for the end of this current this year will essentially exceed the projected 30 by about a percent, probably about 1.7% versus 0.07, with a 0.7% than the projected budget last year. Uh, for our upcoming budget for next fiscal year, we're projecting that it's going to be. Decrease in growth of about negative seven percent, and then returning to about two point percent growth in this year twenty four twenty five. So, experiencing kind of the pandemic and inflation increase, kind of that inflation we're getting into right now, and return to normal growth. After the projections, you can see the financial statements that James always provides for you. And if you have any questions on that, happy to ask them along to that. We don't need to take any action and just put out it. Any questions? I see none. Uh, the public, do they have any questions? Um, I'm not seeing any members of the public with their hands up on this item. I have a quick question for David. Um, I think I noticed that Sonoma County was lagging the state in terms of revenue growth. I think it was across all. I didn't have any funding to be specific about that. Does that ring any bells? Yeah, I'm looking at that percentage now. Let me say in the fourth quarter of last year, it was uh, 3.6% growth rate in Sonoma County, which is 4.7%. I'm not sure the reasons for that difference, but it's just. Yeah, just, just wondering if there was anything that was a takeaway from that. But I, I don't think there's a. From the table in that, I know we're still performing very well in all sectors of growth really as of the last quarter, but I think a lot of that is inflationary growth. Thanks. But in those days, you know, like in consulting, we have exceeding, you know, that with other segments, we have them. Oh, that would be the other end of the exposition. It was the fuel, the gasoline category, significantly higher than our growth. Uh, gas are being inspired to the local state, which makes me wonder are local stations not reducing their gasoline retail rates? And maybe that's why our revenue is higher in that category. Just an observation. Yeah. I think we are now at the climate and the protection of sugar and climate. Yes. Thank you. Uh, am I uh, loud enough for folks? Maybe it's shot on if I'm not loud enough. Uh, so, Drew, if you could go to page 45 in the packet, the one that has you know, kind of mobilization strategies of the Kevin or Bain. Bain Thank you. 45. Yeah, it's just a couple of things. Um, all right, that's perfect. So, um, so I'm signing up the director of climate programs for the RCPA, and I wanted to give all of you a um, brief overview of the work that we're doing on the Climate Protection Initiative. And I'm going to go briefly through this slide deck or a portion of the slide deck that we presented in a public meeting last Wednesday. Um, so as you may recall, we, our board adopted the Sonoma Climate Mobilization back in March of 2021, and we started work to uh, implement the strategies and very quickly realized that we, meaning our CPA and our partner jurisdictions and agencies, did not have nearly enough resources to uh, make much progress on the strategies, and that we really needed to secure uh, additional local funding to advance our climate priorities and really tackle the climate crisis. Uh, so that led to, um, so, so the, this is a snapshot of the strategies in the mobilization strategy, uh, broken into three main areas, buildings, transportation, and land and water. 
Um, and we, as I said, realized that we needed to secure more funding to really support implementation. So next slide, please. Can you explain uh, the, uh, like the, the Sonoma County DMT event? Sure. So um, that is a concept that actually Chris and his team have started um, looking into and have applied for a grant actually to get some funding to explore this further. But the concept is that um, uh, developers, for example, could pay into a mitigation bank. We have SB 743 that requires mitigation of EMP. And this could be a way of essentially fluent funding to tackle larger uh, uh, transportation related projects. Mm -hmm. And so we're, you know, the idea that came up during the development of the strategy as a way to increase funding for uh, local transportation. So I haven't really advanced this one very far because it's a relatively new concept. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. And yeah, please stop me at any point during the presentation. Um, so um, the recognition that we needed to secure more local funding led to the creation of what we're calling our Climate Protection Initiative. And this is a community-led effort to um, reach out into the community and identify local climate priorities and solutions that could potentially be funded by a revenue measure. And we're looking to putting something on the ballot in 2024. Our board has not yet decided what that something will be, if it's a sales tax measure, if it's a parcel tax measure, uh, but we're in the very beginning stages of really figuring out what is of interest to the community at large, what would the priorities and the solutions be for climate action, and then crafting an expenditure plan um, to support that. And so we have three committees that you see here on the sc uh, screen, the Transportation Committee, Buildings, and Land and Water, and each of these committees has I've uh, been meeting uh, at least twice now since this kickoff in early 2023 and have developed a draft list of project ideas and concepts in each of these three areas. And uh, once again, if we go to the next slide. So these are kind of the three overarching goals that this funding measure would be focused on achieving. Um, obviously, reducing our carbon carbon pollution or greenhouse gas emissions as fast as possible. We do have our goal of achieving carbon neutrality by 2030 in Sonoma County, and that will, uh, by our estimate, require us to reduce our emissions by at least 80% between now and 2030. Um, also adapting to the negative impacts of climate change that we're already feeling in Sonoma County, wildfires, flooding, drought, et cetera. Um, so we know we're already feeling the impact and need ways of adjusting to those. And then lastly, making sure that whatever we're funding is really benefiting all of our residents in an equitable and efficient way. Next slide, please. So um, as I mentioned, we have these three committees that are focused on the three different areas tied to the planning strategy. And so um, our buildings committee has been looking at electrification and resilience in the built environment. Transportation is really looking at how to increase uh, the use of alternative modes of transportation. And then our land and water committee is focused on our um, ecosystem, natural and working lands. And that third piece is really important because I mentioned earlier that we're, we have this goal of carbon neutrality by 2030. We're fairly certain that we're not going to eliminate all um, carbon pollution or emissions by 2030. That, that would be um, a huge challenge. So we're going to meet our carbon neutrality goal. We need to be able to absorb that extra pollution, carbon pollution that we're still emitting emitting in 2030. And so that will require us to increase the ability of our natural and working lands to sequester or absorb that excess carbon. So that's why that third area is really important. And then lastly, we see that purple umbrella over all three areas. As the committees uh, talked through different project ideas, these three, um, equity, workforce training, and public education emerged as common themes across all areas. And so there's project ideas uh, related to, for example, workforce training. We, we need the workforce to electrify all of the buildings to do the building retrofits. Um, you know, we're going to need um, trained uh, vehicle mechanics who can work on electric vehicles versus gas-powered vehicles. And then public education is really critical to us to our success. So those are kind of overarching. Yes. Hi. Um, one thing I I don't see on there, and maybe it is. I just don't know where it is. It's building out our charging. Yes, Sorry. yeah, and I'll get, I'll get to that in a moment. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide. So this uh, is just an example. I'm not going to talk about all these project ideas in detail because I know you will probably don't want to be here until 7 or 8 o'clock tonight. 
Um, the slides are in your packet and there's more information on our website. There's a much more detailed list of the projects that you can um, look through at your leisure. Uh, but just wanted to give you a flavor of the, the types of project ideas that are coming up in the, in the different areas. So these are some cross-sector project examples. Um, so Dana, if you could go to actually the, the slide after the Buildings Committee. Uh, so these are our two chairs of the Buildings Committee. And then um, in the Buildings area, these are the kind of the three um, areas or categories of projects that the committee has come up with so far. Um, so there's comprehensive upgrades for existing buildings, which means, again, electrifying, um, you know, swapping out gas powered hot water heaters for um, heat pump water heaters, uh, you know, induction cooktops for gas appliances. And then we have the electric vehicle charging infrastructure. And so this, this topic actually spans transportation and buildings, um, obviously, but it came up more in the building committee discussion. So we've included it here. Um, and really a focus on how do we increase access to EV charging for folks who don't have, say, their own garage where they can have their personal chargers, folks who live in apartment complexes. Um, you know, my way to work in the mornings, I go by the new development um, in Railroad Square, and I see somebody who's got a, a cord running outside of their second floor apartment uh, and plugging their car into in charge. So that's not going to be the best solution uh, for the future, so we need to find ways to address those needs, which in part will be increasing workplace charging. You see that as a real key piece of the solution. And then lastly, community scale solutions. So Dana, if you could go to the next slide. Um, so I know that print is very small for folks in the room, but this is just expanding on that existing building theme. Um, and so a couple of the points to, to note. So we do see a need for providing more support to property, property owners in identifying and implementing upgrades. It's a fairly complex or can be complex to, to figure out, you know, where, where is the best place to make investments in retrofitting a home or a commercial building. So having some type of um, ambassador or concierge service that would help advise and provide recommendations. Um, we have a lot of existing incentives and financing, but we know we need to do more in terms of electrification. And then offer assistance for low income households. So, so, folks who can least afford to make some of these upgrades, what additional assistance could be provided there? And then there's a list of example projects. Uh, so, next slide, please. And here are some themes around um, charging infrastructure. So, I mentioned improved access to the charging at multi family housing, um, integrating vehicle to home. Charging for backup power, this is a huge area of opportunity that you know, is not really um, happening um, very much now. And we see a huge opportunity from a resilience standpoint to, to make this more accessible. And then low cost installation methods could be things like um, uh, EV charging on from street uh, like light poles. So there's some pilot projects that are underway in other parts of the country to make charging uh, accessible in that way at a much lower cost. Next slide, please. And then community scale solutions are really looking at things like community resilience centers, um, which you know, could include the concept of a microgrid. So having a, a facility that could completely island from the electrical grid in the event of an emergency, you know, widespread power outages. Um, and then having for EVs developing more strategic charging plans, looking at the community wide at where we need the chargers and how best to implement that. I think those are the three um, areas in the buildings committee. So then in the meeting last week, we asked folks to identify their top three, um, the, the solutions they would support the most. And so we do have an online survey. If you're interested in um, taking the survey, you can go to the RCPA website and we'd love to get your feedback in terms of which, which three of these really resonate with you or you think are most important. There's also an opportunity on the online survey to add comments or additional feedback. Uh, so that's the Buildings Committee. And next we have Transportation. And we do have a member of the Transportation, uh, one of our co-chairs here, um, Eris. I thank Eris for all of her contributions. Um, and I'm just going to walk through these areas. Please feel free to, to jump in if there's something that you want to highlight for the group. Uh, uh, but I'm sorry, I have a question. Yeah. Let me just go back to the charging. Yeah. I'm sure you're done talking about charging. Please. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, uh, the emphasis, because it's all local charging, is going to be level two charging, not level three charging. 
the PCS yeah. charging is not going to be done by the uh, the, uh, the the bid or the bill, the infrastructure. Yes, the yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 And yes. And looking more at corridors. Local. Yeah, yeah. And this is more local. This is more local residential. Yeah. Not being yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Actually, look. Well, oh, was this about that? Yeah, okay, this is about that. So I'll, I'll tell you, there's another another issue. I'll, I'll call it behind the meter. pg e is our local utility line provider, and then we have some with Lean Power. They're doing a great job supporting yeah. a lot of this. Um, I had a meeting this morning at Platinum Chevrolet. They're one of the local ED providers. They already have an application in to change their dealership for more charging infrastructure and looking at their show, their service phase for working on EVs, they're being told by pg e that they can't, there's yeah. not enough power, they can't do it. Do we have a project that's been two years now? pg e can't bring they, it. They're power. telling the dealership that they, that they could do it, but they could only turn the, the, the charging on in the middle of the night. And when we, with those of us that charge at home, yeah. do that because it's cheaper power, but they're a dealership, it's a business. They need to be able to do it on demand. So, so trains and operators as well, they can be charging buses at night. Yeah, so we've got to like this group, we have to push for issues behind the meter, yeah. the electric auto association, yeah. Yeah. the bike folks, all of us need to push because we need this stuff. Yeah. But there's a bigger problem behind yeah. the yeah. I, I think this is going to be a national issue because of the question. But, it, but, but it's happening here first because we are more progressive and we are pushing the money in now. And our governor said no more gas powered vehicles will be sold after 2035. Um, so just to tie, tie back to the national issue, as of the end of 2021, there were 8,100 nationwide power, power projects, both new energy projects and all, all electrical projects coming online. There were 8,100 nationwide that were anywhere between eight weeks to 18 months out, or being told similar things like climate shuttle they were sold. In California, there are, uh, I think it was some 1,500 of those projects that are being told the same thing. Um, I have a, a part of that for NDEA. There's a page of California uh, uh, Senate and uh, California um, initiatives at the at the public policy level that are in HR and SB, that's the uh, regulatory standpoint. The politicians are all over it. Mike McGuire is all over it. Mike Thompson's all over it. Jared's all over it. So these guys are well aware of the issue, but we just have, you're 100% right, we have to push harder to get there. Otherwise, it's disappointing for the I think, uh, you know, the infrastructure, Bill, you know, like, uh, they have, you know, has some funding in the world of that. So, so what happens when the power goes out? We have, we have power outages um, randomly, and what happens if the power goes out and you can't charge your vehicle? So it's an emergency. Backup plans are also needed for sure. Mm -hmm. This is this though. I'm going to say this is a yeah. good segue into where what I was going to say as we moved into the dividing yeah. and what we saw if there are other comments about the the just one thing about it. So with clean power I think you know we'd rather you not do it at night because again that school rate you're what's generating that electricity is you know some kind of fossil fuel power and so what would I think you do is do it during the day or else have a battery backup and so therefore we need battery backups and so it's great to have all this solar but we have no place to put it. Yeah, you know, so, not 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 everybody can afford to get a battery backup. Um, you know, th th there's a lot of poor people. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, questions? Uh, one more quick comment. Yeah, the climate center. Its main piece of legislation that is promoting and pushing and backing is actually using. Um, cars, EVs yeah. as, as as backup power yeah. for power outages. Yeah. So just know that there are groups doing some good advocacy that will help some of these problems. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The behind the meter is there is there a more detailed backup on the feasibility of of some of these proposals? I mean, I look at personally, and you know, you probably guys, I I'm not a 
I'm not a climate denier. I know it's happening. But you look at something like natural gas, right? Natural gas, the biggest fuel source we have. If you take that away, and suddenly you're trying to find electricity in back feed all those all those devices, all those things. I'm just wondering, is there actual science in the spreadsheet showing that if we move in 5,000 stoves and this and that, we will be able to provide that power in these ways? I mean, I don't see it. I don't see it. I, what I see is, is clawing for something that works and going after it. But you can't do that. We've got to look at what, what the reality is of these situations. Right now, we're lucky enough to have a real nice mix of power in Sonoma County. We're lucky to have... Um, Hydro, we're lucky to have you know steam generated from the geysers. We have all these mixes. You start taxing them by throwing other all these cars on there, all these other demands, and now we're going to take natural gas to the cleanest resource we have and try to take those out of homes. Where's all that power come from? Where every year we add more solar, and every year we add more hydro, and every year we still use. I I don't get it. You know, and this this is not an SOS roads thing, but it's it's a thing. I look at this like you take the natural gas away. There's no better way to heat a home. Right, I agree. In the same line, I lived in the new lovely last week, and there was holding the virus. Oh, then yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I like to see. Anyway, I like to see the science behind it. The document. Yeah, yeah. 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 The yeah. California yeah. Energy Commission's Integrated Energy Policy Report comes out every two or three years, I believe, and it has the data you're looking for. It'd be, uh, it'd be interesting for you to look through it. I've read through it. I've read through all the information on the DOE website. I've looked through everything I can find. I've never found any valid support for moving natural gas that makes any sense to me. When I have an interior background, a local contracting background, I like electricity. Put electricity in work and I can do solar. But but I don't get this and I don't get the science behind it. I'm sure if someone much smarter than me would explain it to me. And is your concern that we don't we don't yet have the kind of the master plan or the overall plan that would show how we're going to address these issues? I want to see I want to see a simple spreadsheet that said I'm removing natural gas. We will save this much CO2, and we will have to backfill that with this kind of power, which we don't have a solution for yet, maybe nuclear or something like that. But everything we're doing is electric, and it's going to change our mix of how we make our electricity dramatically. And we don't, I don't see the plan for replacing all these things we want to remove. So we can certainly share, I don't have it right here today, but um, based on our greenhouse gas inventory that the RCPA does every couple of years, we can share the percent of our buildings emissions that are due to natural gas versus the electricity supply. So we could show, and, and as sort of clean power and built for electric and cleaned up the electricity supply and converted to the geysers to you know renewable sources of energy, more and more of our um, emissions, the, the natural gas portion of the emissions has become the dominant piece of that um, emission profile, if you will. And so if we're to get to net zero, as the science tells us we need to do, we must find an alternative to natural gas. And you're right, that it's a big transition and we don't have all of the pieces in place yet to do that, but that's our challenge. And that's kind of back to the funding piece, why we need more funding here locally, as well as you know across California to really make this transition. But, but, it, but it's, it doesn't stop the moving forward. We don't have the pieces, we don't understand how we're gonna replace the natural gas. We don't understand how we're gonna make electricity to replace all that. And yet we're gonna get rid of natural gas. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah, and we're not getting rid of natural gas tomorrow. It, it's, you know, it, it's, yeah, it's coming soon, but yes, you're here. But this says we did a study with that reason, right? Yeah. 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 So this would be a good segue into some of the conversations that we have with the Transportation Committee. So, um, one thing, for instance, is at one point earlier, Tanya, you used the phrase um, alternative transportation referring to walking and, and entering the transit, which I'm going to prefer to even curve active transportation as opposed to alternative, because using the word alternative, it's still assuming the auto centric paradigm. Okay. Thank you. Um, and we haven't really been focusing a whole lot in our committee on EVs because we don't just need a fuel shift, we need a mode shift. Right, if we magically had enough electricity, right, or if we solved the problems that 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 this gentleman was bringing up, the way the magic wand and all of the cars were suddenly electric, that's still not going to get us where we need to be in terms of greenhouse gas reductions, right? Because you still are um, 
producing electricity. You're still mining lithium for batteries. You're still doing things that generate road maintenance. Road maintenance, you know, if you get electric cars are heavier, you don't the roads faster. I mean, there's a lot of other stuff. So um, we also need mode shift and get more people out of using individual individual private vehicles. And so that's what um, what we've been focusing on as opposed to as much of the that you need to stop the so let's go to the next couple of slides quickly because I know you have a lot of people on your agenda and I don't want to pick up the whole time. Um, but I really appreciate the comments and the feedback. This really is very helpful. Um, so just a quick view at um, the bicycling and pedestrian safety and convenience. So making it um, easier and safer for people to use active modes of transportation like biking and walking, um, increasing maintenance. So just as we have with our roads for vehicles, we need to make sure that all these new pathways and bikeways that we're creating um, are well maintained and then additional traffic calming again to make it safer for people to for all users of the roads actually not just bike and bikers and walkers but also vehicles uh, next slide please and these are just the next couple of slides which are examples um, and again you have this in your packet so you can go to the next one um, so here is um, transit so there's a big focus on transit operations um, as well as um, making it easier and more convenient for folks by increasing hours of service um, and looking at programs that would make it uh, more accessible, like um, expanding the free fare programs and improving vehicles and abilities. So, you know, making bus stops more comfortable for folks to um, wait for their next uh, bus stop. So you'll see a number of potential example projects there as well. And then here's some pictures. And then um, expanding support programs for driving less. And these are um, projects like um, bike sharing and scooter sharing, which we've seen some pilot, pilot uh, projects here in Sonoma County offering additional incentives for e-bikes. And there is a statewide program that's um, moving forward to do that. Also at the federal level and expanding commute programs. So again, ways to incentivize folks to Right, different ways of, of getting around town. We get um we get more we, we reduce greenhouse gases emissions more per dollar subsidizing e bikes than you do UV. So I have a quick question. Yes. If you may. Yep. You know, the committees you mentioned here are the public committees. Yes. Yes. Know, yes. What's the structure of these committees? Yep. You know, and yep. the second yep. question, you know, this is an Ambitious, you know, plan. Like, uh, you know, how how to fund, how to structure, to implement, you know, these things. You know, are you planning yes. to put an implementation plan and money behind what you are proposing here? Yeah, the first step is to get feedback, like here today, and with the community about priorities. So obviously, we, with any type of funding measure that we know of today, we're not so, we're not going to have enough money to do all of these things. So identifying priorities in the community, you know, which of these things we want to fund. And then you know, the more detailed implementation planning would come as we start to move different projects forward. Um, we're certainly looking at how to come up with some estimates about you know, cost benefit, greenhouse gas emission reductions. But honestly, those are going to be have to be high level given the amount of time that we have before 2024 and the resources that we have available. But we think we can come up with some pretty good Estimates so you get a sense of the magnitude, you know, the cost of a mile of bike uh, bikeways versus, um, say, electrifying uh, existing buildings, for example, based on our building stock and what houses that sort of thing. So it's going to be at a higher level, but still a way of understanding um, rough magnitudes of cost. Oh, and then, uh, oh yes, the committees. So the the program committee committees are open to the public. Most of the meetings have been held on Zoom. The transportation committee is meeting in a hybrid format. In fact, their next, next meeting is here on Thursday from 4:30 to 6. Um, all of the meetings are posted on our CPA website. Well, my question was not about the operation, the, meeting, the structure of the meeting, the committee. You know. Like who's on or who the... is on the who decided these committees and the yeah. commission? Yeah. Yeah. Right yeah. now, the group here is you know citizen advisor. Mm -hmm. you know. And of course, you know, dominated by different interest groups, uh, by districts, and so on. Yeah. These committees, what they are presenting? Exactly. They're all volunteer and they're open to anyone. So we basically put out a call for who wants to come help 
uh, you know, who has an interest in transportation, for example, and, you know, welcome anyone to come to the meetings and provide input. We're also, um, we've got identified a list of key stakeholders and we're putting a plan together to outreach to those folks as well. So an example in our buildings committee meetings, we haven't had anyone from the North Bay Association of Realtors and we really want to make sure that they're aware of what we're doing. Um, so we're, you know, making a list of groups to go out and, you know, at least let them know what we're up to and, and um, you know, go and make a presentation or meet the, meet the groups. But we haven't put any boundaries around who is in the meetings and, and who is not. It's not, um, not officially. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you could say there are folks who haven't heard about the meetings or who aren't able to attend them, but we're really trying to be as open as we can. Okay. And all of the meetings are recorded. They're posted on our website. So we want to So many are ideas, some themes are there. There's sort of also a uh, theme that I that came out of those Sonoma. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that are funded, or yeah. at least we thought were funded. So yeah. it's just, you know, as you're going through this and asking for another sales tax, another, mm -hmm. there are people already included these ideas in the last one that yeah. we already have. We haven't even started the planning. We yeah. can probably clean up that idea. Yeah, definitely. And that's, yeah, for sure. And that's what, so um, maybe we should skip to, so the way, um, there's a whole land and water section, which may be of interest to some folks in the room, but again, in the interest of time, I'm going to suggest that we skip. I'll just say briefly that Dennis's point came up in the land and water creeps as well because of the ag yeah, space. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to talk about kind of our next steps to get to your question about how we're, how I think we're going to address some of those um, concerns and questions. So if you could go to the slide that has the next step. Yeah, whoops. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, that slide right there. Thanks. So uh, we are bringing uh, this item is scheduled for the next RCPA board meeting on May 8th, and we are planning to present all the feedback that we've received. I mean, not in the detailed sense, but kind of the, the common themes that we've heard um, from the 419 meeting, and we certainly can bring forward feedback from this group as well and share those draft project looks with our board to get some input and direction in terms of how should we carry this work forward. Are there, you know, to your point, Dennis, about um, the overlap with the transportation measure? How would the board want us to move forward on that? You know, are there things that we should just take off the list entirely? Is there a way to better clarify what would this new measure fund versus what's already in the Go Sonoma measure? And I agree that's very important to have, um, you know, figured out and, and communicate very quickly. Um, we have the same issue as Tom mentioned in the land and water space with ag and open space and the funding that they have. So there's some kind of um, areas that we really need to delve into further and make sure we have our board's feedback and direction to how, to, how to move forward on those. Uh, we are also planning to do a poll in June, a first poll to really gauge community support and interest in this topic. Um, and I, I don't know yet the specifics of that poll, but it also could be a way for us to get feedback on the type of measure. We've gotten um, some feedback from community members, concerns about doing a sales tax and the impact that that has on lower income residents. Um, so we want to get a sense from both our board as well as the community on that topic as well. Um, so then June and July will be the poll itself. And we'll be taking a look at those results in the late summer, early fall timeframe with an idea and intention for the program committees to bring their final recommendations to our board in December. And the board would then take that along with decisions that have been made about the type of revenue measure and move forward in the spring of 2024, you know, assuming the decision is to move forward with some type of measure on the ballot in 2024, then the board would be developing that expenditure plan, very similar to the process that we went through for the go Simone measure. So we're really trying to start early and, and engage with people as much as we can to understand priorities and, and concerns and questions like you all have raised today. And, you know, certainly would invite you to the extent that you're able to, you know, participate in the committee meetings. Um, you know, if you've got a group that you think we should be reaching out to, uh, please let me know and we'd be happy to give a presentation or have a, have a meeting to discuss these further. Yes, Jay. <clears throat> you might want to remind people that the genesis of the membership in each of these three sector committees uh, started off at a meeting that you convened at the uh, oh, Park. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's when I yeah. attended as an individual who yeah. 
read about this, and I have attended um, transportation and uh, land and water yeah. meetings yeah. as an individual who signed up basically at that December meeting. And so I don't know how many of the people in this room remember that that meeting was convened by the chair and the vice yes, chair of our yes. CPA by Chris Rogers and Linda Hopkins. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Yeah, in addition, you know, I would add in a question, you know, like consider expanding the you know, representation from the stakeholders. If you want to propose a measure, yeah, you know, we we want to have a successful measure in the support. Yeah. Yeah. And the other question about uh, is it October or August fall? Uh, would you include, you know, one of the questions uh, would it be the amount of the measure? Is it broader set, half set, oh, one it set? Could be, you know, yeah, yeah. You know. yeah. If we plan to work with a public firm to help advise on, you know, what are those questions that we should ask, and, mm -hmm. and that you know has come up as one of the possibilities for sure. And yeah, we definitely want to be as inclusive in this process as possible. So if you there's a know of um, groups that you think we should be reaching out to, um, would welcome um, you know, your inputs. And we have, as I said, we generated a pretty extensive list, uh, but you know, open up the inputs. Thank you. Thank you. More questions for Tanya? Yeah. yeah, I brought this up at the meeting that the Library Commission had earlier on this month, and they are talking about renewal of what was Measure Y when it transcends that. Uh, they're moving towards having that on the November 24 ballot. I believe that the Bay Area Housing Finance Authority may be considering having a nine county uh, housing bond measure on the November 24 ballot. And so I will, I'm just making the same statement I made to the library people. Who, I assume you have smart. It, be, it could be a private. I assume we have smart also coming up again. That needs to go. And, and uh, I see the revenue of the and it should be that could be a crowded field in the number 24, apart from other elections. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, did the other counties uh, consider in a similar measure, or did they have already passed measures similar to the one we are talking about? There. Or also, is there an effort for a regional measure, you know, like uh, the housing measure, the climate change? You know, as, so I am not aware of any other counties that have done a climate specific measure um, or any that are currently thinking of one, but you know that, that could be a possibility. I have heard rumors of a, a Bay Area or region, regional type of climate um, measure, but I have not, there's no details or, you know, not sure if that's, I mean, I don't think that's going to be possible for 2024 since it's not, if it's happening, it's not a very, um, visible effort yet, and to do something like that Bay area wide, I think would require pretty, um, you know, big undertaking. So, we're, we're, I think, among the first pursuing this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I do have a, a little card that has the website on it, so I'm going to pass this around if anybody's interested. And the survey that I mentioned is um, on that site. So. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I feel to ask uh, do you have any of the public have questions about this topic? Um, <clears throat> there are no members of the public on Zoom actually right now. So then, no, there is no public comment at this time. Move to the agenda item about. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is an update going back to the question of the committee last month, and we wanted to give an update on as we can write the three. Uh, as you may know, it was passed by the voters in November 2018 to raise the goals and 
bridges and uh, that whole increase went into effect. And there's some more challenges that followed the funds. We will come to dismiss uh, the California Supreme Court in January. Now we are with uh, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, the toll authority to move uh, by this board. Or to know the county specifically that was project funding set aside for the Highway 101 and the Arrows, which is the point of the between Marine Snowman County. Obviously, uh, we got funding is based in what is known as 77, which is a project that's in construction right now. I think we're going to auto, which is about coming into 2024. Uh, there was 40 million set aside for the extension of SMART, two million in Woodsburg, 100 million set aside for improvements to the state route 37. And uh, 100 million region wide total for the North Bay Transit Access System, which 20 million people are just known to come. Uh, on the handout that we sent out this morning, there's a table that kind of shows the status of all of the projects and what projects have had a million and what remaining. Uh, specifically, for us, for the Marine Snow Narrows project, we still have about 28 million that's uncommitted to future. Uh, needs that, uh, for example, the fall landscaping projects in Paloma and other uh, things that may be coming up. For Highway 37, there's 65 million. Uh, so between Marin and Sienna, it's committed to any of the project yet. But there's 20 million set aside for the Highway 37 series improvement project. And then in Slavic County, they have 15 million of the remaining 100 million for energy projects. 40 million for the Smart Commission of Women's Recovery will be submitted already. And then uh, lastly, on the show on the table, we have 20 million, as I mentioned earlier, for North Bay Transit Access Improvements. That funding source has very specific uh, types of capital projects to be used for, and it can be all be used by the transit operators in the county, which are Petaluma, San Luis, and the Smart. With that, have to answer any questions you have, but as I mentioned earlier, which we're looking at, you can see come up with updated schedules and funding plans for projects and you have know, procedures on how you example the stream of the project access money. Any questions? Um, yeah, I have a question about the last one that transit access. Um, you said that's very specific. Is that EV infrastructure or bus capital purchases? It's mostly like bus capital purchases. It could be safe routes to trains, and so bicycle pedestrian improvements. So it is kind of restricted to the bus operators and smart people. I spoke is if you read the text of the Senate uh, I think I, I need to go. Yeah, uh, 595. It gives examples of what those places could be. So perhaps show. Purchases for like basically last mile uh, accessibility to the train and to the bus system. But we're still going up with the seat. If that is one of the critical, you can see And I should note, Smart, I believe the last four meetings uh, had a contract award for MO. Last mile travel service on the airport station, uh, airport smart station to airport terminal. So I think there's other options for that in the future. Great. So it exists that there are strong funding on our train and are we sticking now? This is our entire portion of the program. But you say in the last storm, they have named our MP funding. So correct. are we expecting more money from the middle or so the remaining funding is just showing what hasn't been committed to any project at this point. The committed funding is kind of showing you what's already solved and committed to specific projects. So for example, the 20 million for North Bay Transit Access Permits, that's all the money we're going to get in that category, but we haven't committed to any specific projects. But then it's taking more money from you know, the dogs and the boots, right? You know, like the uh, area. Uh, yeah. I envision we might get more money. There's one more total increase in, in yeah. 25. Yeah. Right. And so they're collecting the tolls right now, which will be generated over time. And to do these projects, NBC will be having to issue bonds to pay off the tolls over time. So there's a set projected amount of revenue that they're going to get over 30 years or whatever the, the bonds will be. But the measure outlines the exact. Amount. Uh, yeah, this is a kind of bonds. Mm -hmm. uh, 
in those things. So what's uh, the extension, if I may ask, to explain the smart beyond years of, you know, is it a picture of funding here? So this funding is only for the extension of the winter and the extension of the group. The future extension of the was not coming. I might say, as the person who signed off and putting RMP on the ballot back in 2018, um, these projects were very specific at that time. And of course, as the memo explains, uh, from that time on until now, which is five years, the money has been invested. Actually, my question um, is. How well did the uh, money uh, do at whatever escrow place it was held? <laughs> How is it invested? I hope all of the DC staff to see if they can give us that information. It's not good. Well, I was genuinely interested, man. Of course, what I'm really interested in is SCPA staff will be developing a process. Um, to distribute the North Bay access funding, but also you, you'll be working with MTC staff already as to how these monies are going to arrive up here and so on. Okay. Yeah, so in March, we were working with MTC staff to kind of update our previous snows that make sense in 2019 on the status of the projects, what our significant needs are for short term bonding, also when we be. Projects. And so we didn't have any short term needs for this afternoon this year, but for example, the North Bay Transit Access Program, which we think we need to afford on the next couple of years. Yeah, the, the concern I had was obviously that over the past five years, the cost of projects has risen. Uh, I don't have it, it's reached any quiet years as far as I was concerned. And that was why I'm interested in the, the money's grow in escrow as well. To, Maybe keep up with some of those increased costs. So no doubt we'll be briefed on that in the future. Thanks. Just as an add up, if you're interested in how much money actually is in hand that you don't have to bond for, mm -hmm. so there's actually some things that we'll have to get back to. Yeah. If a question you know, do we have the resources within these projects? You know, like, because we have a lot of money in the flowing. You know, that's you know another thing to consider, you know, that, you know how to train people to build that. I think it's an industry wide issue with charges, contractors, charges, planners, engineers, there's a kind of a brain drain of what part of the years and contractors stuff on how it was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's maybe you said this already, I just wasn't paying attention, but there are three line items for Highway 37. Mm -hmm. Do those correspond roughly to the ABC segments, or is there that's not perfect? Somewhat. So the 65 million still between room and SCTA. It could have some overlap between segment A and segment B. Okay. Um, the fairgrounds interchange in Solano is definitely segment, segment C. Uh, and then, of course, the Sears Point Mayor on the crew around in segment B. Because I think the segment A has already been is moving close to being like it's correct me if I'm wrong, I haven't been following that process as closely as some of you, but. The A segment is the one that's anticipated to be constructed first and to be constructed um, in full anticipation of CO. So we anticipate the B segment will be constructed first as the interim series point of the improvement project, but here of Rex segment A will be anticipating the CO of the rise to year 2130. So B is a temporary investment that will need to be completely replaced because of CO rise. So it's only twenty only uh, twenty million dollar investment that we're temporarily in, investing in there by, by this point. And then Mare Island, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the fairgrounds interchange segment C, Swan, 
that too is going to be temporary. Right? That should be a permanent uh, improvement because that interchange is not subject to sea level rise. Yeah, it's it's, it's close to the highway. Thank you. Appreciate the clarification. Do we have any public questions? No members of the public are on the Zoom call right now. Thank you. Any announcements? Yeah. Um, May is coming up and it is National Bike Month. And of course, we're doing bike to, bike to work month, bike to work day. And this is the first time since COVID that we're actually going full out and doing the full range of activities that we were able to do ahead of time. Um, so we have, uh, I won't bore you with the entire list, but I'll pass around the flyers and there's a QR code on there that if you're interested, you can scan it with your phone and it will take you to the full list of things. But one of them is um, we're having a big sort of sweepstakes at the end that will be uh, drawing uh, you know, names for some giving away some bikes and some other gear. And there are numerous ways that you can participate or get entries in that, with the first one being uh, going online and signing our pledge to write your bike at some point in May or on like day and other things that you can get involved with. So I'm very excited about all this stuff together. Thank you. Any other announcements? And I see none of them. I'll go and then give me a Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.